Walk with me through the cellar door. A storm is coming, Francis. A portal to a more skeptical world. Cellar door skeptics begins right now. Prepare for the revolution with your host, Christopher Tanner and Chris Hanna. Welcome to episode 68, Orwellian versus Huxleyan <laughs> and Humanitarian Values. Thank you so much for joining us tonight on Cellar Door Skeptics. As always, I am joined by my co-host, the Mr., the great Christopher Hanna. How are you tonight, sir? I'm pretty good. I don't know. It's just kind of foggy here in the middle of uh, the end of a... A long work day. I'm just hazing you. I'm going to have to see if you can't fire it up and get me energetic. <laughs> we can always do that. So tonight, so tonight, Hannah, I thought we'd, um, we, we, we gave this episode a little more over to you. You, you picked two out of the four topics we're going to talk about tonight. Oh, yeah. So we're going we're gonna to talk about, is homeschooling a detriment to a child's social development? So this week, we get to tackle if the homeschooling is going to be harming the child or if it's more tangible option given the recent nomination of Betty DeVos. We also have an interview with David Teachout, founder of Life Weavings and the Humanitarian Humanity Values Podcast. Later on, we're going to kind of take a look also at Neil Postman's book, Amusing Ourselves to Death. And we got to decide, does our future look closer to Orwellian or Huxleyan? perspectives that's, i don't know is that a real word it is, is that not a new word? But that's what we're known for buddy <laughs> <laughs> that's so, that's a, it's an interesting um thing that you just created a word when we're talking about orwell you do realize the the similarities there that i did like, that's some double thing stuff right there making making up whatever works to fit your uh, perspective <laughs> <laughs> i just make fun of the uh, orwellian things just dying i know things. i know you're making fun of me so we we we're going to talk about that but we're all we got to start the episode out talking about Justin Trudeau and at least i can say his name correctly because nor- yeah. normally i can, i butcher everybody's names but tonight we we're going to start the episode off talking about Justin Trudeau and his infamous non aggressive handshake oh man but before we before we get into this we wanted to make an announcement last week was our our premiere episode of through the attic window Right. So have you ever wondered what we thought when we're not constrained by facts? So look no farther, because this is going to be an uncut and raw thoughts about life, politics, science, religion. And we're just going to kind of toss our minds out to everybody. So we created an opinion series to kind of bring the the amount of show we do down a little bit and then to help boost uh, being able to give an opinion once in a while because we felt we didn't want to detract from the show. We want to keep the show very fact-based, but now we're going to be able to di- dig in and create more of an opinion. Just riff. We're just, just going to riff sometimes. Just like get your gut feeling out of there. Kind of like when you do a rant, but there'll be two people involved in it as opposed to me just sitting here going, I wonder when he's done. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Randy, so much for naming that segment. Also, on future episodes, we're going to have a, a bunch of amazing guests coming up. We're going to be talking with Jeremiah Bannister about Team Tiny Dancer, where it's been, kind of how it's been almost uh, two and a half years since the diagnosis and since everything has kind of started going around. So we're going to talk with him a little bit about his journey with Samantha and where what's in store for him and his wife now. We're going to be talking next week with Glenn Tipsbergy about... None other than the Rational Politics Project. The week after that, we have the Podunk Polymath Podcast. And we're also going to be throwing in some socialism discussion with an, a socialist activist who I believe is a Marxist supporter. He's, he's, he's all over the place, so he's relatively new to it. So he's got a bit of Trotsky, a bit of Marx. It's all kind of mixed in. He's going to give us a little bit of an explanation as to where he is and how he kind of went to where he was, he is now and where he was and everything. It'll be a... It'll be a, a good starter kit for the communist socialist philosophy. Yeah. So let's start the episode out with a little bit of Justin Trudeau. So we have, I have an article from the New York Times, 
And we also have, we also have folks, <laughs> the White House official release. And I don't know how many people think this is good or bad, but we have a joint statement from Donald Trump and Justin Trudeau. And the the discussion here, I just wanted to reflect a little bit because there's an infamous handshake. There's, you know, there's that's going on, but we still have to get along, correct? We still have to be able to work together. And I think in light of some of the recent bans on immigrants, we we want to kind of get Canada's feel because they're our closest neighbors. And, and as being the closest neighbors, we affect their economy and they affect ours quite a bit. And so, Hannah, did you do any of the reading? Did you read the statement at all or see anything today? I know this is uh, rather new for us. I, to be honest with you, the only thing that interests me about this is Trudeau stiff arming the creepy Trump handshake. That was just where this whole thing came in. I saw that they were they were um, they were meeting and talking, and my assumption is Justin Trudeau said something nice and smart and empathetic, and Donald Trump grumbled like a, a bridge troll for a few minutes. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm basically going to assume that it was um, growling and uh, pretending that they were best friends for a little while. Yeah, and and I think it's important, though, the meeting is important because we, again, like I said, we affect both of the different areas. And given Trump's recent comments about, you know, the Mexican border and, you know, how the president is not taking very kindly to to our president now. Yeah, well, that's NAFTA. I mean, that's a huge part of Canada's economic stance in the, um, the entire continent. I mean... If if Trump decides to beat up NAFTA, the Canadians are going to be hurting. So will the Mexicans. So, yeah. So it, in the article, well, I don't know. I guess before we get into the article, there's some main differences, right, Hannah, between our two countries and between the two things that have been said. And that's the biggest thing here is that Canada is not placing sanctions on us, even though I'm sure they don't agree with it. He basically, Trudeau, declined to say whether he agreed with the presidential's executive order restricting immigration. This is what he actually said. He said, the last thing can Canadians expect is for me to come down here and lecture another country on how they choose to govern for themselves. And I think that's very admirable. But we do know, we do know that Trudeau is not supportive of, of, of Trump's policies in terms of protectionist stance on trade in his call for the renegotiation of NAFTA, just like you just said. Because I guess it's 25% of their country's gross domestic product count as trade with the United States. Yeah, That's a lot. Yeah, it's huge. It's a big deal whether or not this gets affected. And so obviously the Canadians are walking on eggshells because they realize that a bully is in charge and they can't piss him off because it's going to turn into you know a giant ego match and so justin when he heard about the um the immigration area he said to those fleeing persecution terror and war canada w canadians will welcome you regardless of your faith so trudeau wrote that on twitter um basically right after i think it was on the 28th or 27th of january so i mean he has taken a stance he took a hard stance and he came to this country he didn't lecture us he didn't try to assuage Trump to his views, but we know that there's a difference of opinion, and he did the diplomatic thing. He just kind of spoke about uh, energy and being, you know, a good economic partner in NAFTA. Uh, pretty much what we expected him to do. I didn't really expect him to be the kind of guy who would try to jump out and go for, you know, the the taglines or the um, the controversy, much like Trump probably would love to. So before we get too far. I got a little clip. Let's, can we play a little clip, Hannah? Do we have time for that? Yep. Turn up the turntables, baby. All right. You ready? Here we go. <laughs> Together, we will advance clean and secure energy with the goal of 50% clean power generation across the continent by 2025. And I believe strongly in clean water and clean air, but I don't believe that what they say, I think it's a big scam for a lot of people to make a lot of money. We get to show the world uh, how uh, to open our hearts uh, and welcome in people who are uh, fleeing uh, extraordinarily difficult situations. We don't know where these people come from. We don't know if they have love or hate in their heart, and there's no way to tell. The fact is that NAFTA has been incredibly good 
uh, for all three of our economies uh, and uh, for workers. I'm going to tell our NAFTA partners that I intend to immediately renegotiate the terms of that agreement. And I'm going to work with President-elect Trump's administration uh, as we move forward in a positive way for not just Canadians and Americans, but the whole world. there we have it folks you've heard out of both their mouths you know exactly where they are and what they they believe and and and, you know one of the things you know the article talks about is that you know trump says he doesn't see canada being the problem he doesn't see canada and the relationship we have with them changing and and i don't you know i don't know whether that's crap or not i assume it's probably going to be factual factual right i mean why would why would trump say that and then change his mind i don't really see him the only thing I could ever see Canada having um, a problem with Trump would be if they start taking in massive amounts of Syrians and, and mm-hmm. re- refugees and immigrants, and then they start using the relatively giant wallless border to the north and uh, start coming across. I mean, there was a whole bunch of people that were found wandering into Canada recently. They were rescued in this minus 20 sub-zero wind, like dying people. Uh, because they were leaving the U.S. because of persecution and fears. Then they heard Trudeau's message, and they started tromping through the woods because they couldn't go across the border, and they had to be rescued and taken to shelters or whatever. So we have we have now basically created an environment in the United States where refugees are wandering into the, the permafrost of Canada to get away from the craziness that we have here. That's the current environment near New England. It's insane. So let's go back to the White House press release. And in the press release, you know, they talk about keeping strong borders, right? Border officials with common practices and common processing facilities. I just can't imagine that Canada is going to be building a wall, but maybe, I guess, maybe, maybe they will. Maybe it'll, it'll be, maybe it'll be like Game of Thrones. It'll be the wall of ice, you know? I don't know. That's the only one I can think of, but they're going to have to go a long ways north for that <laughs> ice to stay. I went to the market downtown this weekend, and they had an ice bar. Well, it was melting because it was like 37 degrees. So we we were doing shots, but you had to be careful when you set your glass on the bar because you didn't want it to tip over and break on you. Yeah. The other things they talked about is 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 NATO, right? So he says, while we are indispensable allies in the defense of NATO— we have multilateral efforts and differences. Our troops have time and again fought together and sacrificed their lives for our shared values. The NORAD, or North American Aerospace Defense Command, illustrates the strength of our mutual commitment. The United States and Canadian forces jointly conduct aerospace warning, aerospace control, and maritime warning in defense of North America. Now, I don't see that as as changing. I, I don't. No I don't way. see Canada as a war as a war mongering you know country. But they do. They do process and they do keep their borders protected. And I, I don't think that'll change. I don't. You know. I don't see why we would change in anything different. And of course, Canada is probably going to somewhat fund you know the fight in ISIS. Now we'll see if they want to go against everybody else. So if if America goes out and starts tries to start another war, right, or another crusade. Will Canada join in? I don't think that this is saying that, and I don't see from his personality that that's the way it is. But you never know, right? You never know. Yeah, I don't really see it being a real big deal. Um, what we have uh, for Canada when it comes to um, the like we talk about their their uh, military spending and stuff. <laughs> the United States is uh, thirty three times more. Uh, expend, uh, spend, spend thrifty when it comes to uh, the Air Force, Army, uh, 6,000 times. Uh, the United States versus Canada is absolutely massive. We spend 4.6 of our GDP. They spend 1.1, and their GDP is 29th versus ours, which is first. So our GDP alone is four times more than Canada's. It's They, they don't have the amount of money putting in, so they're absolutely no threat. The only thing they have that we basically really hate apparently is marijuana i that's the only thing i know of that canada likes that we don't but all right well you know i think it's it's good to see 
you know, Hannah, it's good to see this, right? It's good to see different countries coming together. And I, I'm glad that he came down and had a conversation with Trump. And stiff arm that and handshake. And stiff arm him. Yep, I'm glad to see that too. <laughs> because without a little bit of pushback, Trump's just going to walk all over everybody. And we know we can't have that. We're going to take a quick commercial break so that we can refresh our drinks. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about homeschooling and Hannah's personal... Ah, it's not going to be his opinion. We're going to actually school <laughs> Hannah tonight if we can. We're going to bring out all the facts associated with his homeschooling and socialization. We'll be right back with more Cellar Door Skeptics. This is Ishmael Brown at HNIC from the Angry Black Ramp Podcast, and you're listening to the Cellar Door Skeptics. Hey everybody, this is X. I'm Kyle. And I'm Felicia. We're the Utah Outcasts. Three out, unashamed, and active atheists living in Utah. And we are personally inviting you to let us love your ears each and every week. As we take the news, current events, and pop culture and give it a little twist. A love twist with consent. And we'll be joined each week by a special guest to tell us what makes them an outcast like us. Come find us. The Utah Outcasts. On PodHell.com, Stitcher, iTunes, Google Play, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And on UtahOutcast.com. We finally bought that domain off the kids handing out mixtapes in the mall. Come be an outcast with us. Take care of yourselves out there. Bonne nuit. And you're welcome. If you'd like to join the ranks of Patreons and sponsor the show, head over to patreon.com forward slash cellar door skeptics. For less than a 20 ounce soda or an energy drink each week, you can help sponsor us, the hosts, and our charity of choice. Patreon helps cellar door skeptics create better content, become better activists, and it's going to help you stay healthier by drinking one less soda or one less energy drink each week. Click the link in the notes of the show to sponsor us today because we bring the discussion with the sources. This is Trav Ramone, host of the By Any Means podcast, and you're listening to Stellar Door Skeptics. Prepare for the revolution. We have cookies. And welcome back to Cellar Door Skeptics. Thank you so much for tuning in to another episode here and indulging us and listening to us and supporting us. I told you about the future episodes we have coming up, but we're also going to be guests on some other people's podcasts coming up here in the next couple of weeks. People like us? People do like us, surprisingly cool. enough. Maybe not you, Hannah. Oh, no, mainly me. But, you know. All right, I'm just kidding. They <laughs> like you too. All right, so we're going to be on the Not Another Atheist podcast, which is dropping this week. Oh, and you yeah. can hear us talk about Nazi palmching from Palm. a very vulgar and introspective discussion. So we're going to be there. Uh, we will be on Secular Yakking next week, February, I don't know, 20th, 21st, whenever he gets the episode out. We record on the 20th, so you'll see it sometime that week. And, of course, we'll post our interview link right there in the description. And we're going to be on Skeptics Brew Pub March 27th. And then at the end of the month, beginning of next month, so the 31st to April 1st, we're going to be on Utah Outcast Podcast. We will, of course, have all links, and we'll tag you, send them to everybody, throw them out there as soon as we get the links. We'll spam all of your hidden pages, too. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. Oh, come on. We got links to everybody's stuff. You can't hide from cellar door skeptics. <clears throat> well, you sound a little more <laughs> Aurelian there by yeah, the minute, Yeah, I know. Buddy. That's what we're going to talk about in a little while. But what are we going to talk about this first segment here, or second segment? Here? <clears throat> well, you brought up the fact that you wanted to talk about homeschooling. And I agree with you, right? I, I actually agree with you that because homeschooling uh, was not part of my personal life, but it was part of uh, people I know's lives. You know, for example, my cousins were all homeschooled. And my other set of cousins were all homeschooled. And my third set of cousins were semi-homeschooled. 
Yeah. Did like, they give them out in sets? I didn't well, know no, that. No, no. They're actually like, they had six, seven, eight of them in the family. Oh, wow. But they all, they, I have, both sides of my family have subscribed to homeschooling. And, and how so did they kind of, like that? How was it? Was it successful? Was it pretty normal? Well, now you're asking for personal opinion here, right? And it's going to affect the personal bias. Oh, yeah. So it depends because a lot of the homeschooling that I've been exposed to is done for religious reasons as well as they wanted to be able to control the environment the kids were in. Now, I'm on I'm one side of the family. All of my cousins are, they're still uber Christian. They're still ultra involved in the church and in ministries, but they all have been able to hold normal jobs, every single one of them. So that's a, Plus, yep. I mean, so, functional member of society. Yep. That's a they start. have friends. They uh, have some. They're even in their own like little family band. Like uh, three out of the four boys play in an actual well, they're Christian band. But and I'm not going to play it on the show, so don't ask. But they <laughs> they play. They actually have their own band, and they they've done fairly well. They're fairly good musicians. You know, That's I don't cool. enjoy their type of music, but you know, I could definitely say there's there's talent there. And then on the other side, you know, is uh, some of them join the military. And they weren't 100% homeschooled. They were semi-homeschooled, right? They they went to this Amish-type school, basically. Wow. Really? <laughs> yes. I know you could partially home. Like, I'm going to stay home half the time. The other half, I'm going to go to an Amish school. Yeah, well, it's not actually Amish. They're, they're, it's just a sect that's kind of similar to the Amish, but they believe in a diff- a little bit different, a little bit more Christian-type beliefs. Oh, okay. And then uh, the last cousins, um, all of them have held jobs. My one cousin became a pilot for a little while. Um, until uh, she got really sick, and now she's going back to be um, wor- working um, in medicine. That's and my other cool. cousin's an IT guy. Uh, I have a cousin that's a pastor from that family, another cousin um, who does daycare. She runs her own daycare. And then I have a couple other cousins that are they're actually still being homeschooled at this, this very time. And, and none of them are unintelligent. None of, none of that is, is there. They're, they're all very intelligent. So they intelligent. got good education at home, <clears throat> yes. relatively, anyways. Yes. Now we'll put it this way: we don't talk politics <laughs> among oh, yeah. any of them. We don't talk um, about evolution among any of them. But I could tell you that they were on the one side. We saw them very, very working very hard. Um, my cousins on, on my dad's side. We when we lived in Ohio, we'd always come on vacation up here, and their one requirement is they had to be done with school before we could come up. Well, every once in a while, it, it didn't work out. My mom would want to come early, or we'd have some extra time off, and so we'd come up a little bit early, and they wouldn't be quite done with school. And I used to actually have to hang out and wait for them to be done with school throughout the day, and I could tell you. So you watched them like while they were yes. at home <laughs> yeah. doing their homework, and so you're just like in a corner. It's like, dude, I'm just watching TV. It's <laughs> well, all we good. didn't even have TV to watch. So they, they had a TV, but they didn't have cable. They didn't believe in cable, so we didn't have cable. How do you not believe in It's like because I just didn't want it. Well, it's because well, some of it's a cost thing, but okay. it's it, it, some of it is they lived out in the middle of nowhere, um, outside of Grand Rapids. So they believe that's the it was a bad one. influence or something. I was definitely the bad <laughs> influence kid, and but well, I don't know. I'm their parents didn't like things that they couldn't control, and nah. and it was a you know like they weren't allowed to go to movies for a long time growing up because you you can't stop the movie and say okay this is inappropriate we can't do it now you, again you got to remember. You can't go to them moving pictures. <clears throat> Certain ones. we couldn't. That's tough, man. Yes. But that's the same thing with the TV. So that's an environment, though, that we're talking about. So, like, the homeschooling is an ins- it's basically an incentive for them to control the environment and keep the children in the world and, the, the, you know, the really strict little bubble that they wanted them to be in. And that's that's one thing that a homeschool allows you to do. It sounds like the 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 parents of these kids were relatively decent at their ability to give an education – I'm curious if they went to a regular public school or if they went to a private school or anything like that. But what one of the most important things is that the parents have the ability to teach. So if they taught these kids, maybe they were a little bit, um, I, I wouldn't say so much as stunted, which is what I would expect in going yeah. from homeschool to this environment. But it sounds like they're all successful and the parents did a pretty good job. That, yeah. And on the, on the one hand, on my, my one aunt, um, on my dad's side, my cousins were fluent in sign language. And they probably still are to this day. And I remember going over there, and when they would argue, they would argue through sign language. Like, they really? didn't yell at my aunt. <laughs> they signed. And you could tell when they were angry because they were they really, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's like, and my <laughs> aunt would be the same way, and, and you could see it. 
Yeah, and it was like an unwritten like... rule of that house. There were the arguments very rarely were very verbal. Now, I don't they... know if that was a positive thing or a negative thing. Was I there just a reason? Saying that's what it was. Was there a reason they learned sign language? Like was someone deaf? No, I mean... absolutely not. It was part of a way to help immerse them in, in a different language? culture. Yeah, it's really? a, it's a language thing. I mean, we're talking from little kid birth that I know they were I doing just, this. That's just usually not a language that people pick because it's such an isolated group of people that actually speak it now you also got to remember too at at our ch- at church it's that's kind of you know part of the thing there too you got to think about that you got to think at church what what is a big ministry at church well sign language really yes because if you have deaf people deaf 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 people <laughs> you can't um they can't hear the music they can't hear the sermons and, and that's a big thing um mm-hmm. in the inside of the christian culture at least in the conservative one when i was growing up that would explain why my cousin is concentrating on sign language. That's interesting. I didn't know that at all about Christian like church culture, that sign yeah. language is something they routinely go to. So ah, you learn something new every day. Yeah. I, and I wouldn't a, this, say this is, just so you know, I would not say that that's just some specific norm, right? But I would say that for them, if the ministry-wise, growing up, we saw that a lot in churches. So well, my my experiences when it comes to homeschooling is basically none. I have never really known anyone specifically to, to, that nobody in my own memory that anybody I've ever really interacted with was homeschooled. Nobody that I've known um, in college or anything like that. I know a couple of people who homeschool. One really good friend from when I was in high school and his wife. And they're military. They bounced around all over the place. But that's one of the things I decided to do was just homeschool their children. And his my my friend's wife, She we have talked about this a few times, and she has brought this up. And then I had made this comment multiple times that I see homeschooling as being something that would cause a social crutch or a social stunted growth is basically the way I had always said it, saying that you're not in that environment. You're not in that. I mean, it's a massively, um, I don't know advanced social structure that you're dealing with because it's regular all day long. And But I'm I'm coming from my personal experience of 300, 400 kids in a grade and a 1,000 people in a, a high school. And some schools are really small. Then you're really not getting a lot of socialization. But I always just assumed that by staying at home with mommy and daddy that you just weren't seeing enough people. You weren't meeting enough people. And it would cause problems. It would make people that coming out of their, I call it their bubble, like, what you you said that your um your aunts and uncles could use to enforce their worldviews, and so I expected this to be a difficulty and a problem for kids coming out of homeschool versus kids that go through all of the craziness that is public school. And yeah. now, so let's I guess let's do the social side because I mean I have different um questions about homeschooling than you do, obviously, and I don't worry as much about the social thing in terms of how you're you're relating it, right? Because I did watch my cousins interact with people at church all the time. They interacted with, with us as cousins all the time. And they also went to a special homeschoolers group um, that allowed for that. Yeah. And so they had other interaction. I mean, they didn't have classes of, you know, 100 to 300 kids. You know, the classes were, were, were closer to 20 kids. But they participated in sports when they wanted. They participated in music when they wanted. Um, you know, and, and on the other side, on my on my dad or my mom's side, uh, one set of cousins did get to specifically go to an it's it's a Mennonite school is what it is. I'm, that's okay. Yeah, yeah so they're not technically was, Amish, but was. they're close. Okay. And yeah. so the Mennonite school did allow them from some interaction, and then you know my other aunt did not did had them go to um you know schooling just the same thing as my other aunt did. So that she. My my younger aunt, she had them go to specific classes in tech center typey things, and then that allowed them to get that interaction. So they didn't lack of the interaction with um, other people, per se. Now, they didn't get it as much. They didn't get as bu- big of a variety. Um, they did not get the different teaching styles. But I don't know if that's a bad thing or not, because you're kind of talking about a libertarian perspective versus a more socialist expe- well, I, ex- I would exception. Say it- I would put it more in like the economic way. Ah. So when we talk about the dog eat dog world, the the difficulties and the intensities of uh, it being in a work environment where people are cutthroat, get to the top, deal with it. And there's groups, there's sex, there's there's cliques, there's the stuff that you that you you learn that is a real thing. You learn that it exists in a school, and you have to navigate that that 
world of people that are relatively your age that some of them just don't like you and you have to deal with that rejection that harshness the uh, as Proust would say, you have to enjoy the suffering to become a well-rounded individual. Well, uh, these types of things I always thought were really important, and they were a major part of what defined me and how I found my own personal perspective and self-esteem after being just bludgeoned and, and attacked by people when I was younger. I found out what's important, what matters, education, and being you know self-effacing and everything along those lines. So I always thought that this would be something that would be difficult for a kid that's homeschooled. So that navigating that social structure kind of in like the infancy when kids are young and then getting into the full on one, that's what I always thought would be. So, I mean, obviously, when you're out of school, you deal with people, you meet people older, younger church and on the weekends and stuff. So, like, I always thought that that would be an issue. And for me, what it sounds like, you don't think that's as much of an issue. So you're thinking you're thinking more that the, the actual homeschooling, the regulations, what they're being taught is what we should concentrate on. I do, but I want to because I want to tackle the other thing because you posed the question in a public forum, and I think it's only fair that we address a, a, an email we got from a listener, and and I don't think it's fair to ignore that portion of it, especially if we get to say you're wrong because I like to say that. I don't know if you're wrong or not though because I didn't read all the scholarly articles, but I do think we should touch on that before we move on. And and, and how about this? And I'm not making a judgment either which way. All I could talk about is my personal experience. Yep. And, and the one negative thing I can say about about it is that they did get to get sheltered, so there there wasn't a specific upbringing. Now, in all fairness, though, for 15 years of my life, I had the same thing. Mine was just at a private school. Mine yeah. was no different other than, technically speaking, they got more attention than I did. They were able to excel through grades faster. They were able to complete college classes before I even graduated high school. And... You know, if we want to talk about it from an isolationist point of view, I do have a harder time because it doesn't expose them to other people's parenting styles, other children's dispositions, how other people had different worldviews, right? Yeah. That is a problem for me. But on the exact same course, I, I can't, unless we're going to attack private schools and charter schools, I, I have a harder time saying that's my biggest qualm. Because, again, if we're going to look at it, and, and I'm going to disagree with you a little bit from a libertarian versus, you know, well, it, more democratic my, socialist perspective here. It wasn't my biggest qualm. This is just what, what I had said, that I yeah, believe that you, that's an was, issue. Like, I, 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 we're probably more in agreement on the most important things that you lose in homeschooling. I just – I was one of the things that I had said was the social um, etiquette and social abilities were hurt, and – as as far as uh, the information and everything that we found, it I may not have been correct. We'll find out in a little bit. But um, really, when it when it came down to this, I I definitely think that um, that obviously the regulation and everything is really important, and that the social structure stuff does go into schools that specifically isolate. But um, I mean, did did you want to completely remove, or did you want to keep in the private schools first with, with uh, your critique of my perspective? Uh, we we can eliminate the private schools for now because, again, they, like I said, there is a little bit of a difference there. Private schools are regulated. Homeschooling is not as much. Um, I, I, let's, let's actually get into the statistics that you found. I, I'm very interested in those because, again, I'm open to having my mind changed too. Mine, is, again, was all based 100% on personal experience, and I had good personal experience, per se, dealing with homeschooling for, let's just say, 80% of the perspectives. Well, what I this this is information that was sent to me from my friend's wife, and she uh, she basically said that homeschooling allows education to be personalized. We've covered that, and she says in public schools, if a child struggles in a specific thing, then they have to keep going past that. They can't slow down, stop, make sure they got a total grasp of it, and then you know continue on to the next thing. They have to they have to keep up with everybody in the school, so that leaves people behind, uh, much um, different than what. Uh, um, President Bush always said he wouldn't leave anyone behind, but um, we all know what that did to the education system. But <laughs> <laughs> but she she basically believes that this is a major contributor for low test scores in America and math. And the Literacy Project Foundation tells that 50% of Americans can't read past an eighth grade level. So her children, as an example, they are not particularly math minded, but they're very creative. And her son is very interested in history. So what she does to master or ensure mastery of these skills, she spends several days on each lesson. And so what that does is, you know, give each kid the time to learn when they need to learn. And 
the, as this goes on, there's something that will come to light as what she does and how what she is able to do with homeschooling that's different from schooling. And I I want to see if you pick it up. But okay. essentially, she basically says that uh, education is personalized to the abilities, without question. So her daughter aspires to be a surgeon. She's eight years old, so she, maybe she's medically cl- minded. This is an area where I think a parent could maybe be directing the kid a little too much because at eight years old, I have a hard time believing someone really kind of knows. But it's possible that she knows she wants to be a surgeon. But her mom can guide her as her interest changes, which is fine. But well, the other, I can interject there. I have an eight-year-old. And yeah. my eight-year-old wants to be a teacher, preferably an art teacher. And that, she's specific. stated this for three years now. That's awesome. You know, so, so I, I, can, I can garner 100% that that's probably not guided by mom. That maybe it's probably encouraged a little bit by mom. But it's, I, I can't say that this is a guided conversation. To me, if that child sees something or relates to something, and then she starts to learn about it and things progress. I, I don't see why she wouldn't. For example, again, we went to Darwin Day uh, last, last uh, weekend for the CFI. And if you, haven't, if you haven't checked that out, you should check out the photos from Darwin Day because it was a really, really, really fun day. The kids got to learn a lot. But there's a little crafts and arts center. Guess what my daughter did the first thing? Within, within three minutes... She went to the craft and arts. <laughs> like, it wasn't to go see the animals. It wasn't to go dissect the strawberries. It wasn't to go look at blood cells. She went to the arts. And she sat there for, I don't know, an hour, literally just crafting. Well, that's an artist for you. I married one, so I get <laughs> yeah. that too. Whenever I talk math, science, and so, politics, so it I get that eye roll. It isn't unreasonable to think that you know this lady's daughter could be very strong yeah, or have a strong be. desire for that. I will say that her and uh, her kids are are very well educated, and this is something else that will uh, will come up in a moment. But um, the curriculum that they have is uh, it's called classical conversations, and they this they what, what I wanted to talk about this is that they meet for three hours once a week in a classroom setting, and then students enjoy each other. Um, lunch together and recess and stuff. So this is th- this was new to me. I didn't know about these group meetings where they got together with like a, other homeschool kids. So th- this is a plus. I like that. I think it's a really good idea. And so um, then it moves on to the um, once they're nine years old, they stay the whole day and get further instruction in the afternoon. So it becomes like one day a week. It looks like uh, a full day of like school school with kids and stuff. But um, then she moved on to the socialization thing. She said that the biggest misconception is regarding homeschooling with people thinking like, as I thought, you know, the stunting as far as socialization. And she asked, you know, did you, you didn't know any weird kids in school and stuff. And then this isn't the issue that I'm, I'm talking about as far as like weirdness or um, awkwardness. It's to be able to function properly in society. Like you've dealt with dealing with, you know, going through different groups and cliques, like I talked about earlier, and you've dealt with rejection and people not liking you, people liking you and, and moving on past that. Um, that was the thing that, like, I, I just see it once you get out of the homeschool environment. If it's not a good, well, in, well structured environment, you got a really steep learning curve when you go to college. So that you're going to go from like a complete controlled environment where your parents were there to make sure everything was needed was was given, and then you go to college. If you're not going to a local school and you're not staying at home, you're going to a dormitory. You're in for a heck of a ride. I just think it would be really, really intense going from that jump so that's the reason why i always thought the socialization was a thing and so she explained i'm going to interject a a second here too though so in all fairness so far none of my cousins have attended college except for one out of all the groups away from home she does mention this in there is that homeschool kids previously had difficulty getting in how old are they are they older Uh, now yeah now like i have a cousin two years older than me he's in his he's in his mid-30s I have one that's my age. Um, I have a couple of cousins that the two that did go away and, and went and studied more abroad yeah. are about my age too. All right. Well, she said that um, when it came to going to college, it, it was it, it has changed. That students are actually being looked for in um, in private universities and stuff. It says that. Uh, a quick Google search shows that articles from Business Insider that Ivy League schools are recruiting homeschool children. And so with the the uh, the classic conversations that we talked about, that that is the current curriculum that she uses. Like those curriculums, and there's a level four, which is a really good one. You complete it, you've gotten a really good education. Apparently, that is considered a well done and well rounded education, and you can get you into colleges. And so it's it's 
the regulation level and uh, there's some kind of accreditation. So if you complete something at a certain level that schools trust that accreditation or that level of regulation. And that's the important thing when it comes to actually, okay, how do we know what you know? Because in a homeschooling environment, there is no real, real, real tight, okay, this benchmark, this benchmark, this progress, this progress, this growth, you know, <laughs> the progress versus growth thing that Betsy DeVos completely failed. Those things are really important. So, that that level is getting better, which is making homeschooling better. And I've I've I assumed that that was the case. And it sounds like the socialization thing isn't as bad as I thought it would because you're getting, like I said, the after school stuff, the invi- the interactions. You said that there is um, uh, sports and music and stuff. Th- these are things that I didn't think was as commonly accessible for homeschool kids. Yes. So ho- provi- hopefully, provided that you know parents that are doing homeschooling are really involved and really care about what they're doing and making sure this is the best thing for their kids, as opposed to just being able to control their environment, then I'm 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 really not seeing as much of a problem as I thought there would be. All right. So a couple of the articles that you found um, talk a little bit about a couple of different things. And, and one of the things in the research was that they found it was mainly the conservative side that had bigger issues. If you were to open it up to all homeschooling students, and we could get to, I, we don't even have enough time to get to all the facts and everything. No. But there's, you know, I was looking at statistics. We, our nation is one of the highest homeschooling groups in the world, in America. And if you if you were to look at that and take a smattering of all these these people, it says that one study shows that 32 percent of homeschool students are black, Asian, Hispanic and other non white races. So it's not just white people who are homeschooling their kids. And that's fair. Right. Because that's my one of my biggest qualms here is that there is a discussion about where the money should go, where taxpayer funds should go. And I'm not in favor of disbanding public schools. And I'm not, I know I'm not a good teacher and would not be a good teacher to my kids. I just, I know that. My I wife would. probably would. would be. I don't think you would be. If I could find, I don't think so. If I could find my family <laughs> and like pay for everything and be able to stay home and be an educator, I would really like that, I think. I think I really would. I, I thought about being like, what would it be like to be a stay at home dad and be totally involved in every bit of education and all the being involved in all that. I think that would be really cool. So I, I'm, I'm completely for that kind of gender or role reversal for myself. I think that would be awesome. But, well, if you could get that and then your wife could make that much money, that would be good. I know that would be really cool. Actually. Yeah. <laughs> so the bigger movements inside of the, the, the issues that some of these things are bringing out, you know, and again, like I say, they're going to call them statistics. They're going to call them trends. Is that you know it's it's the reasons for the motivations here, right? Okay, it's not your academic performance because and let's talk about the academic performance. She she referenced a couple of graphs that actually talk about national averages and yeah. SAT type scores and ACT type scores, and if you look at it, they are they are higher. Yeah, in some cases. It and says, that's basically good. the homeschooling, uh, the challenge for alumni average, the one that we were talking about that she said was a really good one. That one is consistently higher by a pretty significant portion, I mean, maybe 15, 20 percent than the national average when it comes to the public school systems. The only thing I would say is a bit of a, um, a uh, issue with that is that you're looking at uh, a, a statistical number of a very small group compared to a very very large group so it's a, it's really hard to get the national public school averages up because there's millions and millions of children in that and i would say that the the homeschooled children while they are you know being uh, pushed to you know limits in education levels they they they're a smaller number and they like we've said that there's a i would say that the parents are a little bit more attentive and that's one of the most important things is if you're going to be homeschooling it's not specifically for the intention of just keeping your kid coddled it's actually for an education i think that's where you were going to go with this like the intentions it needs to be for the betterment of the child more than just to keep them away from something that you find harmful yep and this one study that we found from TNF uh, online, and it, it's a peer-reviewed study, says that basically homeschooled students who have gone on to college have shown that they were successfully integrated into the college culture, as indicated both by the students' own reports and by objective measures such as a number of extracurricular activities in which they were involved. 
One study found that in the first few weeks of college, previously homeschooled students were judged by their professors to be less socially confident than others, though the students themselves did not agree. They did show they were less anxious than other students and had healthy self-esteem, though. So they're scoring higher. It may take them a little bit longer to adjust, per se. But I don't think that the, we can sit here and pin everything on that. No, I can't. And that's one of the reasons why all of the articles that I linked to our to our um, outline were from Google Scholar. So the scholarly articles, these are cited and sourced actual journals of education. These are real you know, sociologists, real scientists working on this kind of stuff. And I have not seen a, uh, and what I assume to be correct is that a detriment to socialization, I have not seen a confirmation of it. And this is this, I mean, this is a clear case of me learning something. I'm really, I, maybe not in the regulation. Um, and, uh, I, 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 I am scared of the ability to like bubble and coddle a child into a very specific worldview. But as far as the education and moving on into the world, it doesn't seem like my assumptions were correct. And this is something where I will be changing what I talk about and the way I, I, uh, um, talk about homeschooling and what I think are detriments. This is the socialization thing is obviously not something as strong or even as correct as I thought it would be. All right, so let's move on to some regulations here. So oh, I, 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 I do think I agree that you were wrong. We can say that again. Are you were wrong? Yeah, it happens, man. All right. I'm comfortable See, saying it. See, that's the best it. part of the show. You got about. to hear one of the hosts change his mind live on air. There we go. Now, let's move on to some of the regulations because, again, I'm more concerned a little bit with the coddling and with the regulation side. And, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on the coddling because that is more of an opinion-based discussion, to be honest with you. And we don't have a yeah, the it's hard time... To... Or be the resources to have that conversation right now. We could it's have hard it in to the put future. that into numbers, anyways. I mean. Yes. So let's look at some of the regulations. This is where I find them a little bit more more despairing, which is more of the reasons why I've been more against homeschooling than before. Your 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 friend that sent us a letter, she referenced that they've had a flexible schedule. They have the ability to go out and do all these trips. Yeah. So what that does, that says two things. One, they are privileged enough to be able to do those things. You did. That's, I was wondering if you were going to catch up on there or not. And <laughs> yep. yeah. I can't help myself. So there's, there's a privilege well, that's a aspect she, they They are well off, and the military is good to its officers and stuff. So um, they, they, she, is, she, she definitely benefits from a good education. Her parents got her a good education. And I, as far as I know, I'm almost 100% positive she went to a public school. I know for a fact that her husband did. So we are all products of a public education, good ones, I will say, that our our, uh, our schools were very good, but um, she has taken that good public education. She's gotten better at it. She said that her, ki- her children have been taught thermodynamics at uh, six and eight, which I think is unbelievable, but um, I will leave that to her, her reporting, but uh, seriously, it, it, this is a really this is a really good thing that I would say she has done. She's learned and gotten her her children educated really well. But I think there's still a bit of a privilege there that I don't think someone who had come up in a poor environment would ever be able to educate their children as well as she has. I really think that would be hard to do. And so that's an area where I thought there was going to be some conversation for you and me. <laughs> you you got it. There is privilege there, and and. And I don't want to say this is a negative thing. So it, no, it's it, not. It, you know, if she's listening, please, please do not she, take this as negative. I just no. She's giving birth today. Okay, well like, maybe she right won't now. Listen. Yeah, <laughs> it's a, it's insane. So anyway, she said she wouldn't listen because she's giving birth, and I said that's a good excuse. <laughs> I would agree a hundred percent. So, but I want to, I want to go back to that a little bit. The, the the privilege side of things. I think we have to be careful. And there's reasons that social institutions work, and there's reasons why I'm fit closer to that leftist side than a lot of people do. Because I think the it covers the majority. But I'm not of the exclusionary process, right? I don't think we should exclude people and say you can't homeschool. I, I don't agree with that at all. I'll be honest. I don't. I probably would not homeschool my kids. I, I know you just said you would do differently. I could, if if I my could. wife, if my wife, you know, wanted to do it and and wanted to put the dedication into it, I would be okay with that. You know, I would be 100% okay if that's, if that's what she dedicated. And that's kind of what you got to think. My aunt did that. My aunt dedicated her life to teaching her kids. As far as I've been told, if you do it right, 
your day is actually shorter because there's only a few children and completing all of the things that you need to do daily with just a couple of children and their actual lesson plan versus an entire class. Apparently yes. it can be completed really quickly. Yes, it can. My, my cousins could do school in six hours. Easy. Like, yeah. and that's, and, and they were, they were always done with, with uh break well before we were, there's lots of different things, but what it goes back to, though, is you having the privilege, A, of the good education, B, of being able to afford the resources to do this. I mean, homeschooling is not free. You can't just join homeschooling clubs for free. It's, yeah. it's not a, a free resource for absolutely everybody. Do and they if, still let's, have to pay standard taxes? Yes, for and we'll get, to that in a, we'll get to that in a second because okay. that's the other qualm I have with that. Is I don't, and that's where I disagree with, with, with Betsy DeVos is that they want to take publicly funded money and put it towards allowing people to go do school of choice. And eventually that will extend to homeschooling. Now, maybe I could be wrong. That's an opinion. I guess I shouldn't say my opinion. Yeah, but, maybe you're doing a slippery slope there. But I just want to make sure that <laughs> charter schools do get some of that. Charter school, We already covered this. Charter schools don't yep. have regulations in the same way. Guess what the federal regulations are for homeschooling? I'm going to guess Orwellian watching them in every single step. You are wrong. Oh, man. The federal government like I didn't read this or something. <laughs> you didn't. Federal <laughs> government has no regulations other than to let the states regulate it. And the states, the states are regulate it. They regulate all of the homeschooling. So the states really the, stiff, or are they lack. Well, to? it depends. So there's actually a, a, a website that your actually your friend I caught uh, some of the terminology, and when I googled it, I found this website called Homeschooling. Um, hslda.org, which in this this page is called homeschooling laws in your state. They actually color code all the states, and so it tells the, you states that require no notice, states with low regulation, states with moderate regulation, and states with high regulation. Guess where Michigan falls? I'm going to guess we're at the bottom, baby, <laughs> like always. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, Montana, Oklahoma, Texas. Arkansas, I'm sorry, not Arkansas, <laughs> Alaska, Arkansas. it's Alaska, and Idaho are on the bottom rung of regulation. So it's just as you can basically get whatever you want if you well, want to be homeschooled in these I'm states. not going to say that. Well, we're we're going to look at Michigan's one in just a second here before okay. we end the segment. But the the higher end ones are Rhode Island, Maine, Vermont. Massachusetts. Did I say Maine? I did mean Massachusetts. You are correct, sir. Very. Sorry. I was going to say because yep. MIT. There's no way in hell yeah. that, that Pennsylvania, state is letting everybody. New York. <laughs> those all all show higher um, um regulations. So let's look at Michigan's regulations here. Okay. So Michigan has who may stay home from school. The parent assigns homework, and this is actually from Michigan.gov. Okay, this is not from another website. This is from the actual government website. The right to homeschool. They give. Why you have the right to homeschool. They had an amendment in 2010 to increase the compulsory school attendance age from 16 to 18 for a child who turned 11 after 2009, which basically means you can't just graduate all of your kids at 16. They have to genuinely <laughs> show that they can be Just put them way. to work. Get yep. to work. Go to ring with cash. <laughs> who, may, who, may, who may do homeschool? Schooling. The parents get to assign homework, give tests, and grade tests. They issue report cards, transcripts, diplomas, and the responsibility of the homeschool family for their internal standards. Who gets the report card? The kids. You give it right to the kids. Oh, I the was government say, doesn't isn't a report, report card like, it, for it, the parents. I no, don't get it. No, there's not. They do have a reporting process. They have an annual reporting of a homeschool to the Michigan Department of Education, but it's voluntary. It's, it's voluntary. What? It's voluntary. So, like, they're like, "Hey, do you want to go to the DMV and let everybody know that <laughs> no, your kids are doing well?" No, it's not well? like that. But it's it's a voluntary reporting. They so do what are they say, reporting? Just like, "Hey, our the, kids are doing ki well." Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes. They say it is it not required unless the student is requesting special ed services, which okay. right there to me is a detriment. But I, I, I would again, we're already like twenty five minutes in this segment. But yeah, we're it copy. is also recommended that the parent first submit a completed non public school membership report to MDE in special education services. Now, if we go back to that HSLDA website, they actually talk about getting you involved in some sort of a partnership, basically buying into a program. They actually talk about that. And that is pushed. And that's like the most popular school I think or homeschooling website I could find. So I'm gonna say that's a positive, even even on a even on a homeschooling benefit here, that's a positive that they're forcing them to join some sort of a group 
to make sure that they're registered and they're providing the correct amount of information. So there is that. And it is not required that the parent inform any local schools of the decision to homeschool. But it's suggested. <laughs> so yeah, just we're not going to like... tell you, but it's suggested. Failure to do so may result in your student being marked absent. So usually what, what that means is if your kid went to public school and all of a sudden you're like, eh, I'm done uh, yanking <laughs> you out. At that point, they're going to start asking questions. The Fed's like, hey, man. No, listen. with the states. Not even the Fed. Oh, well, that's the right. States. The Fed, yeah. The Fed's not going to be looking into it. They're mostly money. They're the money bags yes. for the operation. Now, let's look at the teacher requirements. A parent or legal guardian who homeschools his or her child is not required to have a valid Michigan teaching certificate. Okay. A parent or guardian reporting to the MDE must have a minimum bachelor's degree to be approved unless they claim a sincerely held religious belief. Ah, I knew it. I there knew you it. go. I knew it. I was going to say, like, bachelor's degree, that sounds good. That's not so, bad. I can live with that. My question here, before we finish this off, my one question to your friend is, do you have a bachelor's degree, or are you claiming a religious belief? Well, she's not in Michigan, so oh, yeah, so she's not in Michigan. What, but what as far as I know, what she and her husband both finished at least a bachelor's degree. Okay, so in college, and, and this again, this is in Michigan's. We're on the low totem pole here, yeah, of regulations, yeah, no, folks. So they're uh, I can't remember which state they're in now, but they were in one of the Carolinas. I believe it was North Carolina, South Carolina. I can't remember, but they. Uh, they they were in the military base, so they no they go from place to place. But uh, um, uh, obviously those rules and regulations change. But as far as I know, they both completed bachelor's degrees in uh, um, in their co- collegiate levels. I don't know if they got a up to a master's degree or not. But um, the, and like I said, they were both very very well educated, and so like their children got good educations because their parents were very smart as well. So this is important as far as like that structure thing. Like I would think that, you know, the, the religious belief being um, something that you can claim is a major, major warning sign as far as a kid being, if you can't comp- properly understand basic math, like how are you, how is your child going to be able to understand algebra and yep. division? And uh, I mean, just in the basic algebraic levels, as far as getting into uh, to be able to do your taxes and understand, how the the credit system works. I mean, this is a major deal. Yes. And they talk about course study, and I won't go into it because it doesn't give a lot of information, but basically you got to be able to get through grades 10, 11, and 12. And they recommend you keep grades, but they don't require it. What? They they don't require you keep student grades. They recommend it because in case you ever want to enroll, then they need it. They do require testing. There is some test that they do have to get if you want to get a GED. So, you know, that was the one thing. If your student can't go get a GED, there's no reason to homeschool them. You know, Wait, I mean, so they don't get a full-on regular diploma; they get a GED. Yes. Oh, okay. So that's kind of that's I know kind discrimination of discrimination isn't typically allowed, but I I would say that there's probably some kind of discrimination when it comes to getting into schools and into jobs if a GED versus diploma, I don't know. But I, we that's, that's probably a, legal. that's another segment. That's a whole other segment, buddy. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> I bet it is. It is. So when we look at the different regulations and we look at all these different things, I, I don't, again, I, I don't have a, a problem with homeschooling except for the fact that when you look at that, if you were to broaden the homeschooling, how can people afford this? And maybe that's why it hasn't, you know, maybe, again, it's just like one of those privileges because homeschooling, a lot of the origins of homeschooling is because you had smaller areas. You and could a afford to send a your... stay at home parent. Like, yes. And you had, you had farm work that had to be done. I mean, there was this need for survival. In this day and age, we're not there any longer, very often. Sometimes we are, but for the most part, most people are not there where their kids need to stay home. And we have rules saying your 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 12 year old cannot go you know work in a factory <laughs> and, and and so that's part of the discussion right there is just that right yeah definitely when it comes to like the one parent white picket fence two and a half children world it's it's not as big as it used to be i mean we've talked about the middle class being completely completely decimated of recent that that is the stay at home mom or the stay at home father staying home and teaching the kids like that's less likely and i would say that it's very difficult for a family to be able to afford having a, a parent stay home all day long with the kids and teach them and so like you said there there is an af- uh, an aspect of having that financial privilege being in that part of society where you can afford that I, I don't really know how a person at the poverty level would ever be able to do that unless they took full um full uh 
usage of all of the different welfare programs that would be available. And I don't even know if there's any incentives that if you are homeschooling, if you get any kind of benefit from uh, from the government or anything like that. I don't, I don't think there you, would you, be. You can't. Sounds, yeah. You can't take it. You can't take federal government. And as we close the segment out, it, it actually there's a section in one of the last websites called Bright the Bright Hub Education. And they actually talk about in spite of the federal government interfering in education on a frequent basis, they use what's called a power purse to control as a loophole, offering states money to enact certain laws. These typical laws don't affect homeschoolers because they don't accept federal money. So if you want to teach your kids at home, all more power to you. This I encourage you to not exclude anything that they would get Hello, I'm Ms. at a public school I'm level. We'll be right back with more Cellar Door Skeptics. Secular feminism, and you're listening to Cellar Door Skeptics. Brew pubs have always been a place to sit back, have a few drinks with friends, and talk about everything under the sun. Skeptics Brew Pub is just such a place. Each week, Brother Brewer invites people to come in and talk about politics, religion, skeptical inquiry, beer, geekdom, and whatever else happens to come up that night. You can join the conversation by chat each Monday night at 8.30 p.m. Central Time on Spreaker or catch the show later on iTunes, Spreaker, Google Play, or any other podcatchers out there. That's Skeptics Brew Pub, where nothing is sacred and no conversation starts without a two-drink minimum. Considering how you want to help Cellar Door Skeptics, head over to iTunes or your favorite podcast app and give us a rating because every rating helps push us in front of new listeners. And since our main goal here at Cellar Door Skeptics is to provide the most accurate information possible, we hope that more ratings will mean that more people get to hear the topics that we're presenting. We don't insist that we get a five-star rating, but Hannah's favorite number is five, and the more gold stars he gets, the more special he's going to feel. So what do you say? Head on over to iTunes or Google Play, give us a rating, and help engage with Cellar Door Skeptics today. from the Country Fried Free Thought Podcast. I hope you enjoy Cellar Door Skeptics as much as I do as they help us prepare for the revolution. Now, back to the show. And welcome back to Cellar door skeptics you're you're in the middle of episode 68 and to kind of recap we were talking a little bit about justin trudeau and how we kind of both find him dreamy we were talking about um homeschooling because hannah had to be proven wrong it was the best thing ever we actually got to hear hannah admit he was wrong live admitted on air and i have to live with myself you do i do got to but anyway, enough with the homeschooling thing. We could go on for hours and hours and hours, and I don't think that's fair to the guests we're about to bring on. So without further ado, what we want to do is is interview a good friend of ours, Mr. David Teachout. He runs Humani- Humanities Values podcast on Life Weavings LLC and is dedicated to exploring the human experience through a focus of the psychology of relationships. In his role as a therapist and relationship living mentor, and which we're going to ask him what that means actually here in a few minutes, I will take he's going to take us through different readings about books and articles that help expand his understanding of what it means to live a relationship or a <laughs> relationally integrated life. Now he's using big words I can't even say, Hannah. David. Oh man, there you go. He hopes that the podcast will create a relationship with you, one where. You get to share is not just a reflection of what you believe or what he believes, but the beginning of a dialogue about what he finds important and what you find important in your lives. David Teachout comes to us with a master's degree in forensic psychology, and he recently finished his master's degree in counseling psychology from 
a gross ER university, uh, and I'm just going to butcher gozer. everything. <laughs> it's just, it is what it is. It is what it is. It's the, it, it's, it's the late hour of the night. You're from the gross <laughs> university, my friend. <laughs> a, gr- a grossy. I said a grossy. He's a licensed as a mental health counselor associate as well. Please welcome to the show our good friend, Hannah's new best friend, Mr. David Teachow. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for having me on. <laughs> we even got, so we even got some applause words. for you. That was priceless. Uh, but but that's the gimmick of the show, right? I'm, I'm allowed to say that, or is that kind of like Trump <laughs> saying my gimmick is I'm a troll, therefore if I say stupid things, you, you have to just accept it. Maybe that's the way I am. No, nobody's gonna <laughs> nobody's gonna stick up for me here. No, all, all, I've got, all I've got is that I, I would give you more instead of the Trump thing. I'll give you the Charlie Sheen, and that you're winning. You're winning I'm when winning. you say those funny words. You're winning. You're winning. Yes. Yeah, all so right. I was just gonna say we should also add to um, to David's portfolio that you just so beautifully elucidated <laughs> that uh, he is my favorite Louis C.K. lookalike. Yes. That's very yes, true. he is. So everyone should take a look and let him know that I'm correct on that one. Yeah, especially since I've gone back to the goatee instead of the beard. <laughs> That's you the know. first thing I saw. It's really I bad. Like, Man. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, David, you started a new podcast. You've had a blog for a long time and you actually used to do an old web show with uh our famous co-host here mr chris hannah back in the day back in the day yeah. like years you know ago. two years ago but you did used Good to memories. run a, a show with him way back in the day where you guys spent an hour dissecting different issues one issue for a full hour how many times did hannah put you to sleep i gotta ask that question <laughs> first <laughs> uh, less putting to sleep and more I don't remember any show ever actually only being an hour oh, um, no. <laughs> I'm pretty certain uh, an hour was uh, was a guesstimate uh, yeah. of where we would go not as bad Usually. as anything and, that Tanner's been on though that's very true he's a window that, that is true I <laughs> yes <laughs> I mean how we used to have three hour debates with Christians Johnny and I did so in all fairness, you're right. Your show is definitely less winded than mine. So you, you, you started a new show, a podcast, actually, instead of a video cast this time. And yeah. I've actually had a chance to check out your show, uh, three or four of the episodes that you've aired. I've not had, heard all of them yet, but I've heard three or four of the episodes. And I find them, I think when we were talking a little bit earlier, I was like, you have a very NPR-ish discussion and voice. And, and like you, you, the dialogue you bring to the conversation here on your show is very NPR-ish. And for those of those of you who don't know anything about NPR, please, please go out and research who NPR is. But if you want a good taste of it, David offers um, some of the expertise and and segments inside of his show that you would get on NPR. He does it very concisely, too. That's one of the things I really like. He doesn't go on for a while. It's right to the point. Like you? No. Not me. So, David, was, were you looking for that? Were you looking to try to get something? Were you mimicking a different style? It's just you naturally just go to that high quality and uh, audio product. Uh, it, it's actually definitely something that, uh, well, first of all, that's really high praise. Uh, if, I, if I can uh, <laughs> uh, mimic and um, uh, reach the audience size that uh, NPR does, uh, wow. I, I can only hope to achieve such heights. Um, but no, I wasn't really trying so much as I had an idea in my head you know, that I wanted it to be around 30 minutes long. Uh, and the 30 minutes would include the intro and uh, the last uh, section uh, involving you know mindfulness exercise. And so it really kept me to a certain amount of time. Um, I have since gone away from writing out the entire thing, which is what happened the first few episodes, to now it's almost entirely extemporaneous. Um, I have readings, and then my commentary is just off the cuff. And then I started laughing because uh, even doing it that way, I still kept to about the same amount of time. So (laughs) it would seem that my old uh, sermon um, training has come up. Oh, man. uh, and I've been able to. Uh, Are you channeling Jerry program. DeWitt? Uh, yes, 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 Mister DeWitt. Um, but yeah, uh, and it's it's been a really 
it really wanted to reach a different type of audience than just the blog and you know in a different way of saying um you know t- topics that uh, was a little easier than than just writing it out all the time yeah. so and, and and looking through some of your episodes and some of the things you do that that was the one thing i liked about it you know you provided a a mindfulness exercise i guess is the nicest way to call it you provided basically a special technique a different thing that you can talk about something to leave the audience with at the end of every show I don't think Han and I must do that good of a job at that because I don't know how many times I leave anybody anything other than, you know, my ranting anger. <laughs> but The only thing that we got that was any kind of mind uh, analysis was the Raz episode we did way back at the beginning of this show. We did. We, I can't even remember, reticulation, arguing system, I, whatever it was, it's like basically going through and um, repetition and re- reaffirming your positions and everything, but they... Like, that was one of the things that I was going to, I put on another little thing down here from mindfulness to crash course or something. That could be a possible topic for when you come back. Cause I have no idea about any validity towards that whole mindfulness thing. If it's woo woo or if it's real. And so I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and so, I mean the, the, the couple that I listened to the, as far as into the four agreements and stuff, this stuff is a little bit above where I was and requires a little bit of reading for me to catch in some of the, the perspectives and stuff. Cause I, I don't have a lot of the, um, uh, theological background that you use for a lot of the analysis that you go through because it is very middle ground like this isn't this isn't a hard skeptical this isn't hard atheist this isn't a hard believer like this is really gray area bouncing around a lot so was that something that you were aiming for is trying to hit a bit more broad audience or um or you do you have a very specific audience in mind oh no i definitely wanted to reach a broader audience um I mean, the the hardcore skeptical, uh, you know, the hardcore atheist, uh, for one, I'm neither. Um, And so what I really wanted to do is take everything from my therapeutic and uh, psychology background and really get into, look, these are things that we as just human beings are going to wrestle with. And... So it wasn't so much about coming to a answer as it was, hey, let's have a dialogue about some of these things that may pop up. And it's less of a let's go holes and destroy and more let's see if we can construct something. Let's see if we can take a, away from uh, these things that often get uh, uh, blasted and see if we can find something that's meaningful and, and good that we can both use. So this is what comes to the mindfulness thing. So, so the for the teach out experience, it's about the journey, not the not the uh, destination. Is that what we're talking Absolutely. about? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> you yeah. kind of sound like Steve yeah. here now. Yeah. Any any time somebody comes to me with a ready made destination, I'm looking for the bill. Um, <laughs> no, time for you. Just, yeah, if if my if my journey through you know uh, fairly strict fundamentalism to uh, rather rabid atheism uh, and back around to a kind of quasi humanism with a appreciation for the spiritual element in psychology, um, if any of that has taught me anything, is that one people love providing meaning to their lives and. Quite frankly, I don't really care what that ends up being. <laughs> um, you know, if if it provides you know meaning, if if you get something good out of it, then you know go right on ahead. I'm only really start getting a debate when you use it to affect uh, how you treat one another. You know, if you're using whatever it is to you know treat your fellow human being like a piece of trash, um, then we're going to have a problem. Um, and, and, that, so, and, and you can do that. Anyway. It, doesn't, it, it doesn't even require a God to treat people like crap. That's very true. I think, I think lots of people treat people like crap because it's a human element. That's just the shittiest part of our nature, right? Oh, it's the shittiest is part. Is that the first one? That's the second one. Ooh. Oh, oh, right. yeah, that's right. Dang We're it. recording, aren't we? <laughs> yeah, the crappiest part of our nature. But you, so your your podcast actually touches on on different types of topics. And I guess I'm kind of interested in in some of your process and a how you determine what topics to go 
I mean, do you have like this master outline? So like, I look at it like this, like Stephen King, when he first started, probably had a very small outline. By the time he was, you know, a making a bunch of money and about 10 years in, he's like, hmm, I wonder how long I can stretch this. So I'm going to make this large outline. And if everything falls <laughs> apart, I'll just kind of cut out these in between ones. But if I can't, I'm just going to make millions and millions of dollars off all these suckers buying my books. But if you look at your podcast, you kind of you so far you've broken it up into two sections. You have something called the four agreements. And then you also talk about interpersonal psychology. So tell us a little bit about how you determine where the segments are going to go and how do you group them all together like that? So the original idea, and it still exists uh, by and large, is to uh, provide a means of going through uh, particular books that I find fascinating and helpful, uh, articles uh, to quote, and that touch on various topics about human relational just relationships, living, meaning, purpose, spirituality, and so on. And I started off, frankly, to be perfectly honest, because it was easy, uh, with Don Miguel de Ruiz's book, The Four Agreements. Um, it's one of those, it's kind of become a, a pop spiritual, pop psych book. Um, the man has made just garbage heaps of money off of it. And it, all power to him. Um, it's certainly better than a lot of the other material that's out there. <laughs> is it, uh, so is it, is that Dave, it, we're not talking about like Deepak Chopra ish. Um, you know, I can imagine how people could come across the book and, um, see it was kind of a pre Copra Copra. Um, <laughs> Before and, you went uh, off the edge of the, yeah, cliff, exactly. the metaphorical. Yeah. Metaphysical and, about, and I bring that up actually in, in the, in, so the first six episodes, um, are about that book. Um, the beginning of an intro, then there are four that go through the four chapters, four agreements themselves, and then the last one is a kind of concluding remarks. And the and there are many moments in there where my interpretation of what Ruiz is saying uh, may I acknowledge may in fact not be entirely what he meant. Um, and I even point out some of the wording that he has where I'm like, look. <laughs> I don't agree. And he's <laughs> probably, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt that he was being um, emotionally free with his verbiage. Um, but if it really ends up, you know, if I get some letter from him or, or one of his people saying, no, we really think that, then I'm going to come right back and go, well, I'm going to stick with my interpretation because I just agree with it better. Hey, Hannah, I think um, I have a challenge. So, I think we need to send uh, that, that episode over to his people. I think that's what we need to do. <laughs> that's what we need. We got a hashtag. Start that stuff up. <laughs> Let's get this fire started. Yeah. So it, it's it's one of those where, you know, it really ends up being, I've gone through the book a couple of times before in the past, and it was fascinating to me going through it again this time uh, years later. And exactly. to, be per to be honest, not getting as much out of it as I originally did. And then even then going through it again, going, oh, OK, I'm getting things out of it that I never would have thought <laughs> previously. <laughs> uh, and this goes right into, you know, how spirituality works. You know, this, this it's a non-fundamentalist uh, version of it where it's just about human meaning and purpose. And guess what? We get to create that. And if we're open to being able to create it in different ways, then hey, why not? Let's just keep moving forward. Yeah. One of the, uh, I'll be honest, and, and one of the things, I was not super keen on that book. I'll just, I'll just tell you that. Like, that was, <laughs> really? There's a surprise. I had a harder time <laughs> with those ones. I mean, it's interesting to hear, but I kind of got, I don't want to say I got bored, but I moved on to your more recent topics. Uh, not surprising. <laughs> and it, 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 it's a Tanner thing, I'm sure. But, you know, we, we looked at it, and it, the one that I liked was working through anger without losing your head. And maybe it's because, personally, I won't say I don't have an anger problem, but, you know, I mean, it definitely fits my character. And, you know, it was able, it was good for me to be able to kind of look back into myself and say, okay, hold on a second. Hold on a second. And, and in all fairness, you know, I, I, I went through stages of grief, I guess, if you want to call it that, when Trump got elected. And and I know I'm sure there's some conservatives that are listening to this that are like, I don't understand how you could do this, blah, 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 blah. And 
And I was like, well, just remember when Obama got elected, I'm sure you went through the same thing. I feel a little different personally about Trump, but I don't want to monopolize your time by talking about Trump. But this this segment right here, you, that portion of it helped me kind of work through some of my emotions. And I'm a person that once you point it out, maybe I won't admit to it right away, but I will admit to it. And then usually what will happen is I'll go back and reexamine it. And I, and I think for me that was one of the most important episodes you've done that has helped me personally. And I am, and by no means saying I don't need psychological help because I'm sure at some point somebody would evaluate me <laughs> and tell me I definitely need it given my upbringing. <laughs> but what I want you to do is tell the audience a little bit about about that um, that episode. Uh, well, one again, uh, that is probably one of the nicest things anybody said about <laughs> one of one of the podcasts that I've done, um, and it really goes to exactly what it was that uh it's evolved into um so it's really changed not not change is too much strong of a word but it's definitely evolved into a a more of a uh, example or another means of discussing the way that i do therapy and so i take my uh philosophy about that um which i refer to as relational act um and act stands for acceptance condemnment therapy and, you know, I take that and I go, OK, how does this actually apply to the various aspects of our humanity? How does this work in practice? And when it comes to anger, in fact, I do um, an anger course at my full time job and will be soon offering it uh, publicly um, online, you know, like so for the Chris's of the world who want to pay for the, you know, yes. better course, you know, more than <laughs> a half hour of counseling. <laughs> You know, eventually I would like to offer it as a kind of a, a video, um, uh, uh, you know, sign up. I think that would be excellent. Uh, so if you guys want to help me do that later on, that'd be great. That'd be great. Um, so, but really it's, you know, it's about, you know, this idea that uh, we all have our values. We all have the things that we care about and what anger is any more than any other emotion is simply a recognition that we care about those things. That's it. I mean, it's it's really not much more complicated than that. It's difficult to put into practice because we get upset, we do something that we may regret or we might look back on and go, oh, should have, you know, could have done something better there. And and the way that our minds work is we draw these connections and we fuse the action with the feeling. And we go, and therefore the action with the value. And then we go, well, wait a minute. Therefore, because I felt bad about my action, I have to now start feeling bad about the value. And I'm coming in going, no, <laughs> the value is an indication of your humanity. The value is an indication of something you care about. And I am never, ever, ever going to tell anybody that something you care about is somehow wrong to do. I mean, caring about something is how we move forward. Caring is, is, is about something is, is how we form our relationships. I'm not going to take that away. And so that right there is 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 really the the kernel of uh, how I approach everything. It's figuring out, look, this is something we care about. Let's isolate that first, then figure out what are the stories we're telling ourselves about this thing that are then trapping us into these uh, behaviors that we think are the only ways of expressing it. And there's just so much more that we're capable of doing. You know, you bring up and you know, so be it. It comes up, you know, I work in, in uh, community mental health. It is a consistent concern of people there that they're going to lose their Medicaid. It, it, it's just there. And it informs their decisions. It informs their emotional lives. It informs how they're going to react to different things. I'm not going to ignore it at the same time. Simply being upset doesn't necessitate that we have to act in a particular way. We can own the fact that we're upset and then go, okay, well then how am I going to uh, connect to all of these things in my life in order to then determine what is the best course of action? What is the behavior that is going to lead to an expansion of life and not, a constriction 
you know, via, in many ways, you know, often with people handcuffs, you know, <laughs> you know we, we, we go to jail, we punch somebody, we stab somebody, we shoot somebody, we go to jail. That isn't helping. That is not, you know, uh, allowing us to move forward in an expensive way. So you're not and, you're saying not to punch Nazis? That's what you're saying? <laughs> uh, we're not going to go there, Hannah. No, 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 no. Stop. I'm gonna I'm gonna cut everyone off because yeah, I, I don't want that discussion. Go. Not today. Do you mind if I, <laughs> as we wrap up this segment, do you mind if I play a really quick clip for click a quick clip, a quick quick clip? What? How are you say that? <laughs> I have I have part of your show <laughs> that I would okay. like to play for people if that's okay with you. Sounds great. All right. Wrote, all identities are limiting. They have to be, as they determine what is and is not bound within a particular scope of selective engagement. We have our physical identities at the biological level, so we know what is and is not our bodies. We have family identities, so we know who and who and is not family, often leading to variations in what is and is not acceptable behavior. We have social and national identities, so we know what is and is not aligned with broader interests often resulting in naming particular behavior as good, if it were done by another, would be considered terrible. It's the in-group, out-group. But it's done not just simply in groups, but any means of constraining or putting walls around groups of behavior. And that's essentially what identities are. They are a means of wall building. And far too often we think of them as impermeable. As reaching to the heavens and not allowing anybody through. And not only does this cut us off from other people, it cuts us off from other aspects of ourselves. And there you have it, folks. You have an official clip from David Teachout himself. He actually, uh, I had him clip me some stuff and send it to me because I figured he'd be better off to do it because I never knew. We never know what's going to happen when we talk to you, David. I mean, it, it could go one way. It could go another way. I mean, we could probably spend another two hours sitting here talking, but then it would ruin everybody going to listen to your podcast. I mean, we want to get people out there to listen to your podcast. So, so tell. Well, tell, I definitely would appreciate that. Yeah, so tell everybody real quick where they can find you. And then what we got to do is we got to commit to another date to get you back on. And and I I I'm giving I'm going to give Hannah a task here. We'll see how fast he can come up with something. While you tell us where everybody can find you, I'm going to give Hannah a task is you got to pick a topic for the next time we have David on so he can pip his podcast again and then on top of that we can actually get into something that he hasn't even aired on his show, kind of as a special treat for the Cellar Door Skeptics listeners. Ooh. I like that idea. All right. So, All right. Tell so everybody where they can get a hold of you and where they can find your show. Yeah. So my show can be found. Uh, I host it through Libsyn uh, and it can be found at the podcast uh, page on my website at life readings or uh, it is also located um, the podcast itself on iTunes. It is on SoundCloud uh, and also Google play. Um and in addition, there are also links uh, to every episode, including, you know, any and all articles that I quote, uh, any blog entries that I might mention, uh, any books uh, that are, you know, talked about. Everything is right there on the page, uh, linked up for you. I'm very much about encouraging continued study. And if you have any questions uh, through any of the material, feel free to draw me a line. And more than happy, and would fact, I would love to do an episode of just people's questions. That oh. that would be a lot of fun. I like that idea. So, Hannah, you had thirty seconds. Did you get a topic? Yeah, I did. All right, I, what's our topic? I want a, a mindfulness good. crash course. So, like, what the heck is basically mindfulness? What are the woo-woo things? What are the things that people think are mindfulness and they're totally BS? And what are the things that are useful and accepted and part of, like, psychology today and anything that's a useful tool for the average layperson who knows nothing like me, like I've already said throughout this episode multiple times, that I'm wrong about lots of stuff, and maybe David Teachout could help me learn what the heck mindfulness is. 
That sounds delightful. <laughs> I would love to do that one. Well, all right. Well, thank you so much, David, for joining us tonight. We'll make sure that we get you back on here next month towards the end of March, and we'll do that. So I'm going to give Hannah a task. You get to uh, schedule the next interview, Hannah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much, David, for, for joining us tonight. Everybody can go over to his blog. You can check out his blog. You can also check out his podcast. We'll have all the links in the description. We're going to take a quick commercial break to refresh Hannah's drink. Let him get rid of some of that uh, urine that's been collecting in there. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about Orwell and Huxley. We'll be right back with more Cellar Door Skeptics. Hey guys, this is Wyatt Mathers from the Atheist Avengers Podcast. You are listening to the Cellar Door Skeptics. Prepare for the revolution. something I could do with a very sexy lady friend of mine that people would find provocative, interesting, and entertaining enough to tune in week after week. Hmm. Oh, I know. A podcast. If you'd like to hear me and Kate be provocative and thought-provoking week after week, join us on the Unbuckling the Bible Belt podcast. We'd love for you to be part of our audiological three-way. Looking for something new and exciting, or maybe just a change from the old Atheist Show format? Cellar Door Skeptics Podcast provides listeners with hours of enjoyment each week on Spreaker and iTunes. Check us out as we talk politics, religion, science, reviews of books and music, along with the occasional interview just for a twist. Join Christopher Tanner and Chris Hanna every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they bring fresh content to you. Walk with us through the cellar door as we help you prepare for the revolution. You can find us on Spreaker, iTunes, YouTube, and even on Facebook. This is Matthew the Apostle from In the Name of God, the podcast. And you are listening to Cellar Door Skeptic. Oh, I hope your pee was good, Hannah. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us on another episode of Cellar Door Skeptics Podcast. And if you feel it was a little too unprofessional to talk about Hannah's pee on the air, send us an email <laughs> over at cellardoorskeptics at gmail.com and let me know what you would like me to say and what you wouldn't like me to say. I just kind of consider it the raw, you know, transcendent discussion that, <laughs> you know, allows us to be real with our, our listeners. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, so for, for those of you who did not see this, we have started a new segment that we're doing uh, every week or almost every other week. kind of just depends on how long the show runs. And it's called A Whole Different Name. And we did this as a way to create an opinion series that allows the two of us to be able to say things that maybe specifically aren't fact-based is the nicest way to put it. And I want to make sure that we give a good shout out to Randy for naming our segment. Thank you so much, Randy. We now call it the Attic Window, an opinion series here right on Cellar Door Skeptics. And for those of you who are subscribed to us on iTunes, it downloads automatically. If you are subscribed to on Spreaker, you'll get a notification that we posted another track. Um, we're, we're not going to ever do those live at this point, unless I guess maybe we could create a Patreon uh, section where we could do a live one. But as of right now, we're, we're going to make those 100% um, just a reoccurring thing that will air every Tuesday or, or, I'm sorry, every Thursday or every Friday, depending on uh, what our week is going. And that's just, again, it's just an opinion discussion for 15 to 20 minutes about one topic that the one of us wants to rant about and the other one has to deal with. <laughs> to put your helmet on for the Tanner episode. <laughs> it's not a Tanner episode. I didn't go off. Well, okay, I did, yeah. A little bit, a little bit, a little, little bit, bit, little little bit. bit. It was about Trump, so... Yeah, so well, this, this week, one. This week's one is definitely not about Trump. No, it's not. This week's one is definitely not about Trump. So 
Anyway, make sure you go, you subscribe to us on iTunes. That way you get all of our future updates, all of our podcasts, and you'll be able to hear as much Cellar Door Skeptics as reasonably possible. Nothing, no comment. Reasonably no possible. Comment. Why not? All right. <laughs> Moving on, because Hannah's a buzzkill. We're going to call him Buzzkill Hannah. Why not? Why we, not? <laughs> You've already been wrong at least once or twice tonight. So. I, I just, I'm just, who cares at this point? Really, oh. there's no point. I have absolutely no integrity, or do I? Uh, uh, did I pick this next segment? Do you I did. have a whole lot of back history with this argument? Uh, that's more than likely true because we're going to be talking. It's the, the namesake for the episode: Orwell versus Huxley. My in my idea is a race to the dystopian future. So, first off, just background: I've read 1984, and this is one of the, uh, a life changing experience for me. And um, I did not read uh, A Brave New World until just recently. I want to say last summer, I think it was. I went through the audio book, and I was really surprised at the similarities, obviously, to 1984. So I checked to see which one was written first, and A Brave New World was written first. Um, Aldous Huxley did an amazing job way before television in uh, predicting basically what a future society would look like with a different twist as to what would make it a dystopian, a, a, a non-utopian. This is, an, a, is not a perfect society. And uh, Orwell, obviously, as most people know, is very authoritarian. So I guess what's your background with those two stories? I'll be honest. I've never. Um, <laughs> I've I've read 1984. Okay, so I have that under my belt. I've also seen. I, don't, I think it's a film, isn't it? It's, it's yeah, a film by the same name. It's not. It's not an actual TV movie. It's an actual film. I've seen the movie or the TV or the movie, whatever. I've seen that as well. Now it has been years. Um, I'm a little bit more familiar with Orwell Orwellian philosophy, I guess, based on. Some of my previous circumstances, I'm not saying I'm an anonymous, I'm not saying I'm a big government conspiracy theorist, but <laughs> I did delve a little bit hardcore, more hardcore into that than anything Huxley's ever written. I, I it just, anything Huxley ever written just brushed off me, I guess. And, and maybe it's because Orwell did a better job, in my opinion, presenting certain types of arguments in terms of the writing style. I, I do think his writing style fits me a little bit better. And in 1984 is a fear-based, you know, it's a fear-based system, right? You know, and it, and it kind of goes in line with the whole animal farm thing. But it's a, it's a very fear-based discussion point, which draws me in a little bit more. Um, So I have more experience with 1984, honestly, than I do with the other uh, book. A Brave New World, yes. Yeah. So the, for those that are not familiar with uh, 1984, Winston Smith is the main character. He's a protagonist, and he is basically a person who kind of sort of is on the on the edge. So like the voters that were recently looking into Hillary Clinton versus Donald Trump, and uh, you know they were on the fence and they were trying to figure out which which uh, which end of the government they wanted to run down. Well, Winston is in the system, but he has doubts, he has questions, and he actually has memories of things that are counter to what is the current political uh, norm, what is the current political truth. And these changes are not supposed to be po uh, pop possible with, when it comes to double think and the ability to hold two contrary ideas at the same time. Um, and so really what it is, is Winston is a person who is still capable of love in a society devoid of such and uh he has memories of when the history was different and he's trying to find his way out of that and not uh, upset the system and get sent to room 101 which is the the horror room that that basically um directly uh, attacks your specific fears. Room 101 is different for everyone. And then uh, A Brave New World is basically this future utopian world, utopian in in uh in scare quotes here that uh Everybody lives this, you know, <laughs> promiscuous life. There's, there's sex everywhere, and uh, people go home with different people, and it's considered weird if you don't go home with someone. And if you go home with the same person multiple nights in a row, that's weird as well. Uh, on top of that, there are uh, hallucinogenic drugs that when you have any dissatisfaction, when you're not happy to the utmost of happiness at all times, you take this pill and it is the perfect hallucinogenic drug. No detriments, no bad brain damage, no pain, no anything that comes with a hangover. It's just a perfect drug. And so society has been transformed into this, um, this 
distraction filled happiness and uh, I call it an ignorant state. So both of these are two different ways of controlling the populace. And it's, it's a different way of taking over how we look at this. And so the question is, is because the reason this all came up is because um, 1984 was number one on the Amazon booksellers list recently after the most recent Trump administration has gone through. Everybody seems to be really, really interested in authoritarian, um, <laughs> dystopian futures they want to know like what does it mean when the the president is saying two contradictory things in the same sentence is this double think are we all on our way to this crazy the future that i saw in the movie and i, I mean that uh, that's basically the whole um driver to what brought this on and it just kicked in this 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 memory that i have of these two stories and the debate between the two and so i guess chris what is your thought? The basic, what I described a minute ago, when like a society full of distraction, you know, pills, drugs, happiness, sex, all that kind of stuff is just there. There is no such thing as a political dis- dissent and uh, political argument. Everybody's just happy, and if you're not happy, you're weird and you're an outcast. And then there's the authoritarian thing, where it's just every single thing you do is completely looked at, structured, monitored. And there's no way to get out from uh, Big Brother's eyes. So I guess which society do you think we would be leading more towards now, and do you think we're going towards in the future? Well, I got a, I got some precursor questions, which is probably why when we talked about doing just a shorter segment on this, is probably illogical. But because you know me, my 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 first question that I have for you, and and just because again I've not read Huxley's book, and and I I know we you presented this way too late for me to spend time reading it. No offense, but. The Huxley book, and, and from what you've described, and from the notes you have, and from a little bit of the reading that I've done, almost kind of seems like a future where nobody cares. People are so disengaged, as long as they're happy, they don't care. That's the question, exactly the way it is. Again, so the, my first question is, 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 the, is there any form of suffering or inequality that is happening at all during this book? There is. Okay, there so is. there is. And how is that handled? What do people do? Is it ignored because they, f- they feel good? Okay, they are not part of the the upper class, so we'll speak. So the main mm. protagonist in A Brave New World is the only person... Well, no, it is. <laughs> it, it, it's the inequality. He is what they call a savage. So he is the only person in this Brave New World who is born naturally of a mother. See, all birth is taken care of synthetically and... Um, People are not born of mothers. You don't have parents. Everything is this institutional. And uh, John represents a unique human being, human being in the novel. He has an identity and a family relationship, unlike any other character who is in this brave new world, obviously. And uh, he's the son of two upper cl- Although the son of two upper-class Londoners, he grows up in a squalor of a savage reservation. So if you're in the upper class and you give birth or whatever, your children are in the upper class. and they oh, live Okay, there. So, so the lower class doesn't get drugs to make them happy? They, have to they live don't a shitty get life? anything. And one of the things they show is that when John goes back to this world and he meets his real mother who actually never gets back into the Brave New World, she's succumbed to the squalor of being a complete and total blithering alcoholic and all kinds of other horrible things. But like he, you are introduced to this vast inequality, this subclass of humans, and you realize that the utopia isn't a utopia. Okay, much so like what's you the realize, percentage of people versus the versus They don't the really one. ever quantify it. It's, okay. uh, I'll do it so it's very philosophical. You talked about these types of things as far as um, you know the uppers, the lowers, and the people. The haves and the have-nots is a good way to describe it. And so like this is a society that exists, but... They don't talk about how many. It could be way more, which more than likely is, um, the people in these small reservations. And the people in the upper class are like, they're you know aliens, they're creatures, they're completely different than anything. And so they continue to live their lives completely in ignorant bliss with all their medications and everything. All and right. so in 1984, it was completely different realization. So the the other, the other question that I had, I guess that kind of answers really both questions, you know, because... People become elitist, and I guess from my understanding and what I was reading through about the notes and some of the books and stuff that you were presenting is that it felt like it was an elitist you know, viewpoint, right? That, But it, it, you honestly kind of almost made it sound like almost everybody was overindulging. And well, that's the way the book starts. And so, you know, in that aspect, if, if, if you're blinded by that and you're actually set aside, and I actually just finished a game called Deus Ex, <laughs> that kind of yeah. 
that that talks about similar belief sets and similar things that there is all these non augmented people and I guess I'm going to say video game terms that you know relate to the the game you have it's to go look it up Dave's here. transhumanist yes. stuff too people that can afford to be better than human yeah. yes and then in towards we're in the second part of the series where people are turning against that there was this big revolution this thing that happened and I don't want to I guess I could spoil it because in yeah, reality dude, it's like a, like a three year old game. Old. Yeah. But you know, it, it it what happened is basically somebody took over all the augmented people and ca- started to try and get them to do bad things, to create a big turmoil a to hacker. push people away against augmented people. Right. So the second game, the game I just finished playing, which isn't actually the second game per se, but it's the second one in my opinion in the series. <laughs> they talk about you know now you're in this dystopia f- future where people are going against augmented people. People are going if if you aren't normal, we're against you. And, you know, this discussion here feels very much like that. There's a lot of people that were taking drugs, that were doing things to make their lives better. And there was a smaller minority that were in the slums. But if you were in there, man, it was bad. And if you were augmented and poor, and you didn't get a certain drug to keep your augments from, you know, hurting you, it was like this huge issue. Now, personally, personally, I feel that this Aurelian and Huxleyan discussions and viewpoints are very similar i think the difference is the breaking point for each right and and i personally feel that we're closer to the huxley point of view right now and i can say that because of what we're watching and what we're seeing i mean i just got a tweet from cnn and this is not a confirmed tweet but i just got a tweet from cnn basically saying guess somebody resigned somebody just resigned again out of the trump administration right so Somebody literally, while we are recording this, is resigning, or at least that's what CNN says. And it, it it's basically the oh, in- Michael Flynn, yes, national security. Advisor. Yes, this is this is again. I don't want to get into that because it's a sidetrack of our conversation. But that's big for me, you know, in some aspects. And so I feel that we are in that Huxleyan point of view. You have a lot of people disengaged with society. You have a lot of people that don't feel like there's a need to continue to vote right because you only got two choices that's what the two choice system is giving us you well, got the people... thing isn't even voting like there's they don't even exactly that far like, and that's what i'm saying is how yeah. many people out of the united states didn't vote hannah oh man a lot the, the majority of people a, in the country didn't vote there's a lot yeah there's a lot of people that aren't voting so i don't think we hit the orwellian future yet no and i would agree i would say that the comparison in my end is uh it really is it comes down to it's going to be more of uh, uh brave new world versus 1984 so this is just some quick points for the comparison so in for as far as books are concerned orwell feared that books would be banned but huxley feared that there would be no reason to ban books because no one would read books anymore like i said the ignorance thing information orwell feared that we would be deprived of information, the Ministry of Truth and History manipulation in a book in 1984. Huxley feared that those who would give us so much information that we'd be reduced to passivity and egotism. I mean, think about it, armchair activists and YouTube stars right now, right? I mean, we are inundated with information and we just become clickers on an internet instead of actually getting involved with government truth or well feared the truth would be concealed from us huxley feared the truth would be drowned in a sea of irrelevance hashtag the internet right <laughs> yeah and, and, and i agree with that hannah oh, yeah. and, and, and think about it we we have some fundamental differences with other individuals inside of our community and, and other individuals that we hang even hang out with right they they don't believe in any sort of restriction they're appalled by some of the issues that are happening, like with punching Nazis, well, even you kind of you know <laughs> feel that way, and you know, and they're having issues with people stopping Milo from you know coming to a campus university, right? Yep. And that they're they're trying to say, look, it's Orwellian here, and I'm saying, hold on, no, that's not the Orwellian side of things. No, it's not the government that's, doing it; it's the people. Is that's like the revulsion to the Huxley point of view. So we've been passive about allowing free speech or not allowing free speech and just saying, oh, this is okay or this is not okay. We, we've been conservative well, the passivity, in that. The passivity from the all-do-us Huxley aspect is more like we're voting on American Idol instead of our presidents. Like that's, that's the big passivity thing. Like the, we're voting and interested in things that don't matter at all. And so yeah. – um, 
the next the next area that uh, for culture, Orwell feared that we would become a captive culture, so every aspect would be controlled and monitored, just like I said for Big Brother. Well, Huxley feared that we would become a trivial culture, so this is a preoccupation. In the book, uh, in Brave New World, he gave things different words. So he called these things the feelies, and these are future movies where the view we put their hands on these little metal knobs and on the armrests, and the sensations felt on the screen, so hot, cold, fur on your skin, food, kissing, they would be felt on the crack part of your body so like if, if the pr- character on the screen was like laying on a bearskin rug you would feel the hairs on your back it was really um you know that's a future movie and people could they were just in, uh, uh, completely mesmerized by these and then the orgy porgy is a chant that's repeated as part of a solidarity circle after drinking of soma and we'll explain what soma is in a minute um, bef- but before group sex. So the solidarity circle is an allegory for religion, but one that promotes loss of self in favor of a group identity. So it's kind of the same thing you get with the church aspect. When you lose yourself, you become part of the mob, in my eyes. I don't know. Church mob. Okay, so I'm going gonna, gonna to stop far. you. Are you sure that he was referring to religion? Are you sure he's not rever- referring to a more socialist concept there? Well, as far as I've seen, as far as any of the um, the analyses that I have seen from people that were, uh, um, I, I had to look for the uh, the source for where I found the uh, definition of the orgy porgy. But as far as I know, that is basically his allegory for religion, and that it in losing yourself in favor of that group identity. But yeah. uh, when you look at the, like now the current uh, the current administer or the uh, the current reality, you could lose that into whatever uh, identity bubble you prefer to be in. Yeah, and and one of the quotes from 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 Huxley is this: He said, "In a brave new world, he said this. He said the civil libertarians and rationalists who are ever on the alert to oppose tyranny failed to take into account man's almost infinite appetite for distractions." Now. If we had David still on the show, and I don't want to spend, again, all night on this, but if we had David on the show, I bet he could tell us the psychological reason behind why we need to be distracted at some point. But the problem is, is it becoming too much? Are we becoming over self and indulgent? Look at Americans. We're fatter than a lot of other nations. We're overly self-indulgent. I, I, I saw a video on how to deep fry a Twinkie, right? <laughs> I saw a video on, like, wrapping something in a cheese, deep frying it, wrapping it in cheese again, and deep frying it a second time. That's overindulgence. Now, I, I'm not saying that that wouldn't taste good, especially if you were hot. Oh, I've had a deep fried Twinkie. They are pretty good. I've had deep fried deep fried Snickers too, and those are also quite good. Damn. But either way, I mean, I, I can, we all we all can relate to basically the indulgences of a modern society. And Orwell, in his idea, he used pain to control that society. In Room 101 is a room that's different for everyone. Inside Room 101 is every person's greatest fear. In the main character in 1984, his was rats. And in other people, it was buried alive or being death death by fire or drowning. And so for Winston, it was rats. And he, that is a head thing that had rats that could eat his face. And uh, that's the way they broke him. And they knew this through their basic information. But Huxley used pleasure control the population and this is where soma comes in soma is a drug that isn't just common it's actually distributed on mass by the government so the drug in question is a hallucinogen decide that the perfect drug all the benefits calming serialistic 10 hour long highs and none of the pesty drawbacks like brain damage or hangovers and stuff so the citizens of the world state were completely conditioned to love this drug and obviously this is going to have some kind of addictive tendencies so we, th- this is satisfaction this is happiness or a false sense of because the highs always go away you don't there is no perfect forever drug and so the in government encourages this but it isn't a forever solution and anybody who comes into the government or into the society sees this and that's what john does when he comes from the savage nations and sees the the new world and he realizes these people are just deceiving themselves so this is the difference in the controls that society the people as a populace control themselves by just going straight for pleasure. In in 1984, they're controlled by the all-seeing, powerful Big Brother. So, and in, in closing, just for this segment, Orwell feared that what we hate would ruin us, and Huxley feared that what we love would ruin us. And so, this is all comparisons from a 1985 book that uh, uh, is called "Amusing Ourselves to Death." 
And uh, we'll include the link in here. You can check it out. But this is this is a really great comparison between these two books. And apparently it's really popular right now for 1984 as far as being something that people are number one on Amazon. That boggles my mind. Uh, the, the, the word analysis and double think and stuff. I would I love the fact that people are reading this book again. Yeah. And and as as we as we wrap up, that's the one thing we gotta discuss here, folks, right? I mean, whether whether we're in either set of futures, I think the big thing here is understanding how we can overcome this and how we cannot become complacent. So Orwellian future to me is basically pushing towards a need of of the SJW culture and pushing for more of an anarchy type discussion. That's how I see it. Questioning it sees, the guy at the yes, top. Yes, we're, we're doing that or we're pushing to do that faster based on the type of tyranny we have in office. Whereas Huxley looks at a more of an elitist point of view where they're looking at overindulgence, which is what makes people feel like they have a safe space and they can you know feel present in their safe space. And they feel that it is wrong in that realm that absenteeism is what you know basically has led to, in my opinion, a very tyranny-oriented <laughs> president. And we can argue all day long whether Trump's doing good or bad, right? We, we can argue that. But if, if he's doing good, and I don't agree with that, but if he is doing good based on a fear mentality, he is using Orwellian tactics to do that. And if you were upset with Obama because you feel Obama was using Huxley tactics... How do we get to the middle of this? How do we find the middle of it? Because I don't see Obama as a Huxleyist endorser. I don't see socialism as a Huxley endorser. I see socialism as saying, hey, we're here. We need to work harder. How are we going to get where we're going to be by getting everybody to work together? So while we may be at this Huxleyan point of view, we should recognize this now and get to it before it turns into an Orwellian future. Because once it hits that, once we get there... We're going to need more activism and more anarchy to help overturn the tyranny we could see. Thank you so much for sticking around for another episode of Cellar Door Skeptics. We will be back next week, 9 p.m. Eastern. Have a good night, everyone. You've been listening to a presentation of Cellar Door Skeptics. Check us out on Spreaker. Cellar Door Skeptics dot com.